I'm Brad King, and this is Stories in Steel. On this episode of Stories in Steel, we sit down inside the amazing Lions Drag Racing Museum and talk to a member of racing royalty, Danny Thompson. Growing up surrounded by racing with his trailblazer father, Mickey, Danny stepped outside of his famous father's shadow and carved a name for himself that will forever be etched in the annals of racing history. His is an amazing story. I thought this would I thought this would be a good place to sit down and talk to you. Said, whether it, whether it brought back good memories or bad memories, but it was you growing up at at, uh, at Lions and Rick was cordial enough to let us sit down and, and talk again in here. But uh, so so here we are in a place that you grew up. So from the very beginning, you kind of grew up in, in racing royalty, which is kind of a cool thing to say. So how how for how far back do you actually remember being around racing? Where what is your memory of that? I mean, I certainly remember this place being built, not the museum, but you know the original drag strip and everything. And that was in I'm so bad on dates, fifty three or fifty four, I think. Okay. And um, you know, so I would have been I was born in forty nine, so I've been six years old. And uh, but yeah, I remember that. I remember coming down to the drag strip. I remember my dad coming the Long Beach Freeway, the seven ten freeway wasn't even built then. And, but they were building it, and my dad would jump up on there and sneak on there and then get off, you know, on their way coming down to Long Beach. But, but anyway, I mean, growing, growing up, you know, going to Lions when I was young, it was, it was very cool. Um, but that kind of stuff went on, you know, with my dad every day. It was racing, racing. And my dad worked at, the, I think at that time, uh, worked at the LA Times. So uh, he worked at the LA Times at night and did all this other stuff and built race cars and engines and, uh, did the drag strip thing in the daytime so so you just kind of grew up in the middle of it so were you actually involved in any kind of racing when you were younger or just watched dad no when i was at lions drag strip behind the bleachers on the what they call the spectator side uh, my dad built a quarter midget track and that was that must have been 58 or so and so i raced quarter midgets over there and i raced over there for two years and this had a lot of fun. It was the camaraderie and everything was great. The drag strip was just on the other side, basically. But what happened is somebody and, and we were doing OK. We were, you know, we were winning races and had a little trophy and trophy girls and and uh, just a ton of fun. Good experience. And then one day somebody got hurt, got upside down. And I can't remember if they hurt their leg or their back or whatever it was. And somebody went running over to the drag strip side and told my dad, hey, Danny got upside down. He got hurt. And my dad came running back, jumping over the, the hay bales, because that's what was hay bales and stuff like that, right. by the concession stands, run over. And there I was, I'd won the race, and I was sitting there with a the little trophy girl, and I was all happy and everything, and my dad looked, and he saw I was all right, but he said, that's it. You'll never race again in your life, done. Sold the car on the spot, done. You'll never race again. So that was when I was 10, and I never raced again until I was 18 when I left the house. And started racing motorcycles wow. so so that was that was the start of something and the end of something before it started again later but but he would he would never support my racing or anything and everything that i've done basically not everything but most everything was all on my own and he would you know in those days uh in lions that happened a lot i mean people got killed sure you know and uh racing was it not that it's not dangerous now it's, it and, and a lot of it's not so dangerous now because of my dad and safety things that he came up with, you know, uh, flywheel shields and, you know, stuff like different things that, uh, you know, help the safety of these people. When when somebody get hurt, my dad would try to figure out, you know, what they could do to make that not happen anymore. But people got killed and my dad didn't want me to get killed. You know, he was being a dad. He didn't he didn't want his kid to get hurt. You know, he wanted me to go play baseball and stuff like that. But on the other hand, all I wanted to do is race. You, no. well, you were ruined from 10 years old. You were oh, yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. Took, yeah, took everything away. And so, like I said, I didn't race again until I could go to the races, but I wasn't allowed to sit in the cars. Um, you know, and the, we had the races, you know, at my dad's shop, which was right down the street here from uh, the Lions Museum. Three miles down the street was my dad's shop. And I built indie cars there, funny cars there, dragsters there, 
you know, everything was there. And uh, the land speed record car that I ultimately drove, you know, to 450 miles an hour, all that stuff got built down there. And uh, the amount of people that were down there, I think, I think at one time my dad had 300 employees down there. You know, oh, Mi so yeah, Mickey Thompson Enterprises, which manufactured rods, pistons, uh, headers, you know, just about everything that you could need. And there was a speed shop down there, sold nitromethane, and you know, so all the drag racers were coming in there, you know, getting getting nitromethane, and that's when you only needed five gallons at a time. You didn't you didn't run a need a drum each. <laughs> So let's let's go to when you were eight, so fast forward to eighteen. So you went from ten. There's eight years of a complete dry spell, and you just Jones and to go racing. So you turned eighteen. Was he upset that you wanted to do it? I mean, he had to, he understood. I mean, he had the same buck. I left. So I mean, yeah, I was supposed to go. I, I went to college, LA Harbor, right down here in Anaheim Street, and tried that for a year. Tried some stuff called uh, eh, some kind of computer class or something, you know, but. I knew that wasn't going to go anywhere, so why did I need to study that stuff? You know? <laughs> so they had they had these little cards and all that stuff. I said this this one. so I went there for a year, and then uh, it's funny. I said, well, I'm going to go skiing for the weekend, and uh, so this is when I was just 18, maybe 17, and I went skiing. I went to Mammoth for the weekend, and I didn't come home for five years. So so it was <laughs> I had a lot of fun, but, but that's when I started racing motorcycles. Okay, and uh, but he didn't know. I mean, I didn't tell him. And uh, because, I mean, mm, my dad was very strict. And this is when parenting was different than it is now. Sure. I mean, you didn't, uh, you weren't told twice. You were told once. And it wasn't, I'm going to count to three. Because you got hit on one. <laughs> <laughs> and But all good. You know, I mean, right. it was all good stuff. So, so yeah, I went I went up there. I was, uh, you know, racing motorcycles. Small small race. You know, winning, but, you know, nothing big or anything. Not not on a pro level or anything like that. But I was making every once in a while cycle news and the little teeny stuff in the very back column. And somebody somebody told my dad, he says, hey, I see the kids winning some races. You know, so my dad calls me up. And I'm up there. He goes, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just working. Because... Working was always the right answer. Right? Sure. Well, what else you do? I'm, I'm working my ass off. And uh, he says, well, you, you racing any motorcycles? I said, oh, man. So I said, well, I've been had. Uh, so what do you do? Well, my dad says, when are you racing next? I said, Mammoth Mountain Motocross this weekend, biggest race of the year. And he says, I'm coming up. I says, oh, man. So anyway, this can, he, this can be bad. This can be good or it can be bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, and, and, and I don't know what it's going to be. He's, you know, I've never raced in front of him except when I was little and stuff. So he comes up and it was a three race format. And I won the first two races and were leading the third race and fell and uh, broke my handlebars. And but I had a fairly decent lead and got back up and finished the race with a broken handlebar. And uh, I think I finished fourth or something like that. So um it was, well, are you going to continue to do this? Well, yeah, you know, on, on my own. Sure. You know, I mean, I'm not making any money. And, you know, I'm just, I'm working construction and racing motorcycles and skiing in the wintertime. I mean, sounds like heaven to me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but he, uh, anyway, he said, well, you know, why don't you come down? So I came back down to Long Beach right down the street here and uh, moved back down here and went to work for my dad as a fabricator and on the off-road team. And then... I rode every race with him, but I wasn't allowed to drive, so I only co-drove. So I would make all the maps and do all the stuff and change the flat tires and you know all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, wasn't allowed to drive, but I could I could ride with him. So that was uh, I was getting a taste of the racing deal, but right. I wasn't getting to drive myself, you know. So anyway, but we I mean my dad and I had a great relationship, but and I think I rode with him for. Ooh, I don't know, maybe five years back and forth, built these cars and, you know, worked in the shop. And John House was uh, the crew chief and head fabricator. And then I worked, you know, I worked for John, worked for my dad. So welder, you know, made parts. And uh, that's what I am anyway, the fabricator. Right. So I, uh, I glue stuff together, cut it out. And well, that's a good way, to, good way to start. I mean, being right in the middle of racing, that's... Well, that was it. the only way that I could race myself. So... It wasn't long after that I started racing my own buggy, but I had to, you know, work on it myself and build it myself. And my dad wouldn't let me work on it in the shop. So actually he did, he let me, I take that back. He let me work on it Christmas day and New Year's day in the shop. Those are the only time I could use the shop. 
Yeah. So what was his thing? I mean, well, I, didn't want, I don't know, but that was it. I so mean, you already had the disease. It's like you're just junior here. It's like, well, I don't know why he would be. Yeah. In, it, it, that, wow. that was it. He wouldn't let me. So do you know who Nye Frank is? Hmm? Nye Frank, Tom Job, and those guys. Well, Nye was working for my dad and Tom Job. They were all building Challenger 2, the car that I, I later you know, ran up at Bonneville. Or at the time, it was called the Autolite Special. Anyway, Nye took me under his wing and I went over to Nye's shop and built my buggy. And so, dig this, right? So in that shop, it was Quinn Epperly's shop, Quincy's shop, right? So it was Quinn Epperly, Tom Job, and Nye Frank, and Danny Thompson. Wow. So I went in there and got to work. I mean, these guys are icons. I probably should have paid more attention because those guys are the, some of the best fabricators in the entire world, but I paid attention and I built my stuff and, and those guys all kind of take care of me. So I, I had to pay rent, right, to go over there, right? And so my rent was, every day I worked there, I had to supply one case of beer. <laughs> so that was what I paid. So every day when I got there, I went and got a case of beer, we put it in the refrigerator and then I would work until, until we all left. So now at the same time that was happening, I was working for Danny and Gaius on the IndyCar team. Holy so, smokes. So I was I was getting IndyCar experience and I was building the off-road car and I was working with some of the best in, in, in the, I, I say the country, but I mean, to me, the best in the world, you know? So so the I was learning and learning and learning and getting to race. So it was no money, but you know, people, we just we just made it happen. And Nye was, Nye was my mentor for, a number of years. You well, know. all those guys, I'm sure, you know, I mean, if you're going to be critiqued, what better grip to be critiqued oh, by going, yeah. Danny, why don't you clean this up a little bit? Well, that's it. Now, yeah. you're trying to, now you're trying to impress them. So yeah. talk about stepping your game up. You oh, didn't yeah. have a choice in the matter. So okay. anyway, that, that was all part of, of, of my early days. So, and I was, you know, doing all those things and working a lot of hours. And, and I mean, when you worked for my dad, <laughs> there was one instance where I had a chance to drive a Formula 5000 car when I worked for my dad. Okay. Now, we were working 80 to 100 hour weeks every week, no days off for like six or eight months. And uh, I told my dad, I said, I have a chance to drive a Formula 5000 car at Willow Springs and I would like to take Sunday off. And he said, nope, can't do it. I says, this is an opportunity for me to do something that I really want to do. He says, if I give you the day off, I got to give everybody else the day off. I says, but it's Sunday. I said no. So I took Sunday off anyway. Sure. And I came back on Monday. And uh, what do you have to say for yourself? So I said, well, I guess I'll load my toolbox up and I'll head out the door. And that's what I did. Loaded it up, had it out the door, and uh, you know, went to work for another IndyCar team. So yeah, it was just, it was all part of, you know, part of the deal. So, um, you know, sometimes I get the dates mixed up and the sequences mixed up, right. of, you know, where you were. What so who did you go to work for then after you left there? I went to work for Warner Hodgson up on Signal Hill and we built a car for Roger McCluskey for, to go to Indy. Okay. So that was actually before I went to work for Angaya's at the Interscope factory. But uh, yeah, so then, you know, I learned to build tubs and that's before carbon fiber and all that stuff. So. You know, I was riveted, and Nye was a head fab or was one of the fabricators over there. So Nye got me in the door. So with indie cars, this is indie cars. This is you have yeah. had your hands on oh, really yeah, so, everything. Yeah, so we built we built them from scratch. You know, I mean, folded up all the aluminum, all the twenty twenty four to fold stuff up, and and uh, did all that. And so I worked there for probably two years, and the deal was Warner Hodgson, the guy that owned it. So Roger McCleskey drove, and we had Roger Mears as our second driver to drive the Formula uh, Super V car, Super V Atlantic, whatever it was, I don't remember. And then I was the next, I was gonna be the next driver. So I was trying to get myself in to drive in Formula cars. And anyway, it never happened. Roger never got the ride, I never got the ride. But then I went from there, I think, then I worked for Interscope for a number of years. And so one year I did 56 events in a year. It's only 52 weeks. At Interscope Racing, we had two teams. Danny drove for both of them. Danny ran the whole deal. But uh, we had the IndyCar team and then we had the IMSA team. So for instance, I'd be at Indianapolis at the end of May, running the 500. Two weeks later, we'd be in Le Mans running the sports cars. And then, you know, then we would go from there and there. So I was doing all of those. Plus I did some off-road racing, you know, 
that year also. So that was that was a pretty fun year. Work your butt off all day long and race on the weekend. And like Indianapolis, I mean, wow, you know, so, and then, then go over to Le Mans and you're in Le Mans for a week. And so, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I had a guess. I wasn't getting to drive much during that time, but you know, I was, I was kept hoping I could get into an IndyCar deal or, you know, something like that. So, and it was shortly after that, I started driving sports or uh, uh, formula cars, you know, so got a crash formula car. Now, now I know how to fix things so I can fix tubs. And this was once again, before carbon fiber and all that kind of stuff. So I bought a crashed, uh, Atlantic car and uh, fixed the tub and fixed all the stuff and went out and started running. And it wasn't it. even a big deal. It's like, well, I can fix all this. I can fix that, yeah. Then after I left Interscope, uh, you know, now I got Indy experience and IMSA experience and off-road experience and uh, I went to work for Dan Gurney. And uh, Dan Gurney's, Dan Gurney's first ride, first drive at Indianapolis was driving my dad's car. So there was a real tight correlation in there. Um, you know, it says first ride, I mean, Gurney, I mean, it's Dan Gurney, right? You know, I mean, holy smokes. And so then going to work for him and that was pretty special, but I got to work under Phil Remington and Remington is like, now we're talking about like Nye and Tom Job and Quincy, Remington's on that same level as those guys, uh, just world renowned. But once again, I learned all of those things so that I could drive. You know, I was fortunate enough to win a former Atlantic championship, uh, second, the Super V championship uh, through uh, Southern California Sports Car Club. Is that it? SCTA, SCCA. Did your, did your dad ever come watch you race at all? Did he ever see He came to around? Long, I ran Long Beach Grand Prix and I raced down there a few times in, not in the IndyCar class, but in the, in the junior formula class basically. Okay. And he came to Riverside a couple of times and stuff like that. But uh, he still, he was sticking by his guns and didn't help, you know. So um, I was running on rag tires and, and um, you know, that's, that's just the way it was. Sure. You know, that was acceptable. So I still was out doing what I wanted to do. And, and um, yeah, but yeah, it was, it was all good. So now later he did help me into the off, into the off road deal. He steered me in that direction steered me away from indie cars so i was right i mean i'd won a lineup championship you know i mean that's that's one step down from indie that's cars pretty close you know, so it was i was just i was right there and all i wanted to do ever ever no school no lawyer no any of that stuff i wanted to go to indianapolis i wanted to drive at the speedway that was that was my goal in life right and i was i was that close and uh, mm, didn't happen I guess I guess the matter is how old how old were you in this? I mean, obviously it's through your twenties and yeah, I think where yeah where did it go there? So the off road deal I was already when my son Travis was born, my wife Valerie and I had a son Travis and he was born in eighty eighty seven, and um, so I was already thirty eight years old or something somewhere in there, uh, and uh, used to be good at numbers, not too good at numbers. Anymore. <laughs> Um, you know, so the, the age was progressing. This, none of this happened, you know, right away. So, um, but yeah, and then when Travis was born, that was when the MTEG deal was going on, the Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group. Okay. So I, uh, my dad steered me to the Chevrolet deal and because um, he didn't want me to go to Indy, but, he, but the off-road deal, that was a lot safer. And then I took it over and, you know, ran it from there. But, uh, but he steered me to that. And uh, so we ran my dad's series and Mickey Thompson off-road series where we run inside the LA Coliseum right. and Anaheim Stadium and all of so. And I drove for Chevrolet factory for, I think eight years in that series. So, you know, I made a living Had I think at one time we had 10 or 12 people working, you know, on the off-road trucks and we were building from scratch. Um, you know, they were $200,000 cars back then. Sure. You know, racing the Toyotas and the Dodges and, and that series was that series was bitching. I was on awesome. Yeah. I went to a few of the races. Yeah. Oh, it was great. They were good. Anyway, my dad passed, you know, during during that time and everything. I got fired from Chevrolet, right, from, because uh, they started another team and they hired this kid. I think he was about six or seven years old. Uh, that was really fast. 
his name is Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so I got replaced by Jimmy Johnson. So that's actually an honor now. It's you know, actually but, kind of funny. It is. It is. So the time you were mad, it's like punk. Who's this punk kid? This punk kid. That's really, really fast. And I mean, the guy, the guy's awesome. I mean, what he's done and, right. and incredible. But, but uh, anyway, Jimmy took my place and they put the team over to Nelson and Nelson. And then I went to work for Ford and I drove for Ford uh, for a couple of years for Nye. Actually, and I ran the ran the Ford deal uh, for for Jim Venerable, and uh, then my dad passed, and then uh, mm, the people that were running Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group were struggling, right. and the company was in big trouble, and so I quit driving and went in to run the company, but by that time it was too late. You know, it was it was so far in debt, and so it went bankrupt in. I think 1995. At that time, my wife Valerie and my son, who was just a uh, you know, young fourth grade or something, we moved to Colorado. I was a fabricator. I did all construction and I did copper murals and uh, staircases and you know all sorts of you know trick stuff like that. Any anything somebody else couldn't do, they'd bring it over and and because uh, I had. Can you uh, make this happen? Can you make this happen? And oh yeah, I've done lots of that. I had never done any of it before ever, but. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm a fabricator. Sure. You know? so, I mean, I learn from the best. So uh, what's a staircase versus a, a funny car? <laughs> so, but it's all math. It's all so, the same thing. It's yeah, all math. It's all math. Exactly. And and welding. I mean, I love to weld. I mean, it's like my favorite thing. I've told this story before, but my wife and I, so now I have, uh, so I have my shop up there and I have most of my dad's race cars and stuff in there. And I have Challenger 2 or the Unlight Special sitting in there, right? Sitting in the shop. It's 72 steps to walk around that car. And I walk around that car almost every day looking at it and looking at it. And, and I'm talking to my wife, I'm saying, I wonder if that car would really go 400 miles an hour. Because I still have, so Indy was gone. I'm too old for Indy, right? I'm not pretty enough anymore. Sure. Not that I was ever pretty enough, but you know, I don't, I'm not gonna do any commercials and, and sell any cologne or you right. know, beer or whatever it is. So I wonder if that car would really go the, you know, 400 miles an hour. Because my dad, so my dad went, 406 in 1960 in Challenger 1, a car that him and Fritz Voigt built in the garage in El Monte. Then in 68, my dad got this Ford deal for running Mustangs at Bonneville, which was the introduction to the Mach 1 Mustang for 69. So this was 68. And he wanted to build a streamliner because he never got the record. He went 406.6, but one way. He broke on the return run. So he never had the official record. And that was always, Bonneville's what made my dad. It's what put my dad on the map. And uh, it really, you know, got started to get rec recognition and stuff like that. So he always had that taste. So that had, that had to eat at him then, not being able to Oh yeah, back not get that, that record. Up. You know, he had that, he had that yeah. desire to get that, like I did to go to Indy. Right. So anyway, uh, 68 came and, and they got rained out. And so that car set for, now my dad's, so that car set for 40 years. So when was that car built? 68. So how come it didn't go back out? Because the Ford deal fell apart so, or what? So, so Ford, Ford, General Motors, uh, Chrysler in 69, they all quit racing. They all stopped supporting racing. Sell on, race on, or win on Sunday, sell on Monday, went out the door. And they all quit racing out in front. You know, so they still did deals on the side and everything. So Ford never picked that program back up. So that car went in a trailer, never to go back out to Bonneville again. And my dad went on to, you know, racing other things, whatever it was, boats or planes or whatever his next passion was. Right. And uh, so it, it just sat, it sat in a trailer for all that time. So in 87, my dad comes to me, goes, I want to run the Autolite Challenger 2 car. I says, well, that's, that's great. I says, you need any help? I says, I'll come up and help you. And, and that stuff, he says, no, I, I want to run it, but I'm not going to drive it. And I thought, well, whatever. I said, I'll still come help you. He goes, no, he says, I'd like to have you drive it. Now, right. I heard my arm standing up, right? So this is after all those years, right? And I said, okay. And so we got the car out. We started looking at it. You, you probably couldn't believe you were hearing those words from no, dad. I, I was now 38 years old. 
So the car's been sitting for 20 years. This is, so if it was 68, yeah, 68 now you're 88 roughly. Yeah, so yeah. it's almost 20 years now. Yeah, right? So it's just been sitting. And he says, I want to run that thing. So we got out, we started looking at it and you know, everything was, um, you know, making a plan and all that stuff. So this was, this was now going to be a father son project. So now, I mean, we're going to do this together. And then three months later, my dad gets killed and I'm going, Took, took the motion right out of it. Yeah. Just sucked it right out. It yeah. sucked it out. I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to do it without him. I mean, it was. Right. It's his car. It's got his name on it, all the way across the side. So, then it sits. And it sits for, almost another twenty years. So, now, I'm back to sitting on the couch with my wife, and it's. Uh, you know, I wonder if this car will. Wonder if this car would really go that. So, dropped everything moved down here say down here from colorado right. back down to huntington beach and started to work on this car we didn't have any money and we didn't have any sponsors but i was now determined i want to go to bonneville now let me regress here a little bit i've been to bonneville a few times and i i had a couple of records already at bonneville uh in the previous years before that uh jim travis's pumpkin seed was a car that was my dad's at one time restored and drove it and uh, drove a Mustang up there for Ford and uh, set a record up there. So, so I had some I had some Bonneville experience now. And I tell you something about Bonneville is anything you think you know about racing and drag racing, I don't care, drag racing, road racing. Now, I'd, I'd have a lot of experience by now. Throw it all out the window because none of it counts at Bonneville. Bonneville is a completely different animal. You go up there with total respect for the salt and learn how to drive again up there. So when I drove for Brent Hike and the Mustang, <clears throat> excuse me, in I think it was 2011, once again, the years, you know, colliding. Uh, yeah, 2010, we went up and we ran and we ran 200 and I think 58 miles an hour in a Mustang. Wow. So it was the world's fastest production-based Mustang. And it was the third year that we ran up there with the yellow car and uh, 264 miles an hour and it took off i say what i mean by take off it took off like this so did it, did it happen rather quickly or did it was it like slow motion when it started lifting it it got it got a little sideways and i thought this is okay i've been driving sideways my whole life sure all that baja stuff all that stuff this is no problem well that's what i referred back to everything you know about racing doesn't count at Bonneville. So the thing went sideways and it came back. I said, that's okay. I was legging it on down there and all of a sudden it just took off. Went 25 feet straight in the air. It flew 1,100 feet through the air. It rolled seven times. Bravo on the 1,100 feet. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> With no it, wings. It went upside, <laughs> upside down through the five mile mark at 246 miles an hour. So, wow. yeah, it was like, hmm. This, and I didn't get hurt. So, which was, that was a miracle that it landed that hard and did all those things and it knocked three corners off. It did, it did have a right rear wheels, I think, left on it. But. Did you, were you able to climb out of it or did you have to, have to pry a bunch of no, stuff? No, it ended up landing on its wheels. Yeah, it ended up landing, no, there wasn't any wheels okay, left. On its but it landed on its, yeah, in the right direction, <laughs> except for the right rear wheel was still on. So yeah, um, yeah it didn't hurt me. Yeah, I drove, uh, I loaded that thing up and drove it back home the next day on the trailer and uh, Brent got me a nicer room that night. We were staying at a pretty <laughs> crummy hotel. He got me a room with a jacuzzi in it. So, so I was a little more relaxed after that crash. Right. But I think it saw 64 Gs. It took a hit, but uh, it was all good. And uh, we put that away. And then that's what ended up leading back to uh, the Challenger 2 story. Okay. I had to regress there. Sure. Cause like, cause I'm old and I forget stuff. <laughs> but you know, and that was the start. I had the Bonneville bug now, you know, the Indy bug was gone, not gone. It's always still there right now today. I look at that Indy car over there and I'm, <laughs> I can fit in there. I can do it. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, that led to the Bonneville deal and that led to coming down to Huntington beach and starting that whole project. So, which was besides my wife and my child, the best thing I've ever done in my life. What all did you have to change as far as safety from 
40 years ago till now. Did you have to redo the cage? Ask me, what all did you have to change on that car to update it to their safety? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> so it, ha it had two, I gotta tell this story because it's great. So it had two single overhead cam Fords in it, SOHC Fords. A blown one in the back and a normally aspirated one in the front and you set in between them. All right, so now, so you're making 1200 horsepower and 600 horsepower, okay? A little bit of nitro. And so my dad, <laughs> the genius that he was, so the throttle pedal in the car has two pedals that split in two. So the right pedal is a rear engine and the left pedal is a front engine. So now at one tachometer with two needles, and so if he's thinking that the rear tires are spinning and the front tires aren't, he can roll his foot over and pick up, drop off the rear and pick up the front. This is heel and, and toe to a whole different level here. This, this is, is like, nuts. This is like space age stuff. There's no computers, right? Right. This is way before computers and all that stuff. So I looked at that. That's the first thing I took out because I know I'm not smart enough to do wow. that. Wow, <laughs> that's that's pretty awesome. It kind of yeah. so I still I still have those and I still have them. I have them mounted on a little plaque. But okay, but that was the start of it. And to, to answer your question, basically, so the engines were gone. They had been sold way before that. Uh, it had rear ends in it, and that's basically it. Bodywork, bodywork, basically is the same. We uh, Tim Kipson came to work for us, and he's a engineer. Worked for. Uh, all the top drag race guys, uh, uh, Bernstein and Force, and uh, worked at Dan Gurney's, and you know, really, really good aero guy. Uh, so he came to work for us, and we lengthened the car by 32 inches on the back because we wanted to separate the center of pressure from the center of gravity a little bit more to give the thing more, stab more stability when it was in yaw. So that was the only real that's a aero. Bunch. That's a bunch of stretch. That's, yeah, that's a bunch of stretch, 32 inches. But so we, we decided we would go with uh, Hemi's and we went with Brad Anderson aluminum block Hemi's, but we didn't go blown and unblown because that's too much horsepower difference that we wanted. So we went with two injected motors and uh, Jerry Darien did the original uh, setup on you know, the cylinder heads and the aluminum blocks and all that stuff. And then uh, Richard Catton and uh, oh, Craig Johnson and Rich Kurtz were our engine guys on this thing. Because it was running on fuel, wasn't it? It was on nitro. Oh, yeah. What kind of percentage did you run? Well, we started off at 50% and uh, as we as we were trying to learn, and we went to 60%, 70%, 80%. Uh, and then the last two runs where we went 446 on the down run and 450 on the return run, we went from uh, 83% to 87 percent the last run oh, i would love know, to so, have been there about uh, the four to hear that thing oh, talking boy, talking <laughs> and i mean and i've been around nitro pretty much you know most of my life and everything but you don't start understanding it until you drive it right and so they said the difference between the three percent nitro that we put in it more for the return run was almost 600 horsepower between the two engines and and you absolutely knew it i mean when that thing lit off on sunday morning on the return run it was Hmm. Everything's, it sounds different and everything, but now you're sitting, you got engine behind you and engine in front of it. You're, you're basically, you're a 6,000 horsepower. Well, that sandwich. has got to be an amazing, I mean, I've been, I've been around, you know, the, the fuel stuff for a long time, just been part of it. But, but with it in front and behind, I can't imagine what you're sitting in the helmet. You, you had to be giggling. First of all, you're pushing it off, oh. just going, okay, this is just dumb. <laughs> you know? The best dumb that you can ever do. <laughs> and the thing just purring, just, yep. just, Going on it's, the track. And it's just going. And it's uh, basically, it's a, I think it was 68 second run. So you got five miles to get get going and get your speed. And then you got three miles to stop, which is, people don't think about that so much at Bonneville. Stopping is as big as an issue as getting going. Well, you know, because my dad had like 13 miles, 12, 13, 14 miles in the 60s. But now we're talking about, we're going to a surface that's been being robbed of all the salt and the magnesium chloride and all of the things that bind everything together, they've been mining it for 75 years. So when my dad ran out there with 24 inches of salt, now we're talking about two inches, three and inches. And it's a heavy car, a lot of mass. 
out of mass. I mean, we had issues with parachutes breaking and all that. So I got to ask, how much fuel did it burn? <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, between the two engines, 42 gallons. Okay. Yeah, to go five miles. The very first, the very first five-mile run we made. So the record in our injected fuel class is 394 miles an hour. So now we've run one time on three mile. We ran El Mirage a one mile just to see if it would go. And uh, <laughs> we're going through there and the thing runs 392. Very first run. I never been I never been over 260 where the Mustang. This is getting your attention, right? isn't it? So it's like things are happening. And uh, you know, I mean you the thing takes it's got four and a half, five degrees of steering. It takes almost a mile if you want to turn it in a full circle. But you're going at that speed and you just give it a little bit of this and it's like Whoa! You know, I mean, you're holding on because the track's 100 feet wide. It used that 100 feet up so quick that you can't even believe it. But anyway, we go through the lights and they go. Phew. So I, I uh, pull the parachute and now liquid all over me. And I'm going, what's the liquid? This is a dry block. There's, there's, there's no water. There's nothing in there. And I'm going, oh, man, I can't, I mean, I can't see anything. Well, what happened is because the controls and everything, you, once again, you got a car that's at that time 50 years old and you're trying to make all the controls work. Well, we had the, the parachutes, I mean, the fire bottles at a very, very short pull because they were right in front of the steering wheel. So I didn't have to pull them very far. Yeah. Well, we had the cable so tight when the parachute hit and it took the uh, like that, it fired the fire bottles off. So it's the fire bottles going right in my face. And that's why I can't see. I still don't know what's going on. You're going two and a half football fields per second. You're using that real estate right. up like really quickly. And it's like, what is that? What is it? So naturally I can't see. So I open my visor. You get well, blasted in the face of right straight in my wow. eyes. So I can't see anything now. So now I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, am I at the six mile, at the seven mile? You can't go past the eight mile, you get stuck. There's no more And so track. finally I said, Okay, I got to turn off. And I turned off and it, it was funny because the eight mile, I turned off at the eight mile where well, there's nothing left after that. And there is a, there's a, so the sign is a four foot by four foot sign and it's orange and then it has a black eight in the middle of it. So it starts at one and goes all the way to eight, right? And in front of three foot in front of that are four cones. And somehow I went right in between those signs and the cone and didn't hit anything. Because otherwise it would have ripped the whole front of the car off. You know, even, even a cone sure. at that kind of speed. I mean, you're slowing down for sure by that time, but not because of skill or anything, just because luck happened to got through there. Anyway, we came to a roll to stop and uh, we got out and analyzed everything and we're going, Phew, that was pretty lucky. Well, we filled the fire bottles back up, fired the thing back up the next morning and it went 419 miles an hour. So it ran just fine. You just yeah, the fire bottles went the off. The fire bottles went off. Now, now we're qualified for a record. Okay, you know, and this is the first time out, so we're 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 pretty darn happy. Next morning, return run, and uh, George Poteet told me when I first started this deal, he says, Dan, he says that down run is pretty darn hard. He says, but that return run is really really hard. So we're on the return run. We're we're really hoping for a record, and we go about a mile off, and and we lose a clutch. So our fault because. I have mine silenced. Want to step on those? It's my mother. Oh, my mother's the only one that she can dial through. That. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she can dial through the rigger. She, she, That's not, great. She, she turns ninety-five this this Saturday. Oh wow! Maybe you should have taken that phone call. Yeah, that was a good relator. Um, so the clutch. So, so, so the clutch. So the clutch breaks, and um, by that time. I think it's starting to rain and that so that was the end of it that was 2014 so first first basic time that we ran the car and we had some pretty good success but we still don't have a record now we're still in the same classes or same situation as my dad who went over the record but didn't do it two ways so we don't have a record so now it's okay well we'll come back in 2015 go home fix everything re readjust the clutch uh, or re machine it and you know, do, fix the mistakes that we had. And uh, 
2015, it rains. 2016, it's starting to rain. So we went 585 days or 582 days without running at Bonneville. Here comes Thompson. He is running hard. I was cheering you on. I was following you. Yeah, and a, yeah. lot of, a lot of guys were following you. Yeah, doing, yeah. It, was, it was Danny Thompson. Man. It's like, go get him, Danny, man. Come on, you got to do yeah. this. And it's on Nitro. And there's, I mean, George's thing is amazing. George is oh, amazing. Yeah. That's just oh, absolute yeah. it's amazing. spectacular. Yeah. But you're doing it full on old school. You're old just school. dumping a yeah. crap load of Nitro in it. And yeah. Let's go. No traction control. Everything is right through the seat of your pants. We're just doing it from, you know, how it feels. And I mean, even on our on our 450 run, which was 459 out the door, when it got, when it, Challenger 2, got to the four and a third mile mark, there's a actual dip in the mountains over to the left and the wind will come through there. And we had a 12 mile an hour crosswind and it came across us and at 430 miles an hour, it went lock to lock three times. You can feel 12 mile an hour, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it just did it. It just threw the cart you know, into, and, and, and the one thing you learn about Bonneville is when you get sideways, you pull the parachute. Once again, it pulls, separates the center pressure from center of gravity and gives us the car stability when it's in yaw or sideways. So, so you know that's what you do. Well, the thing got sideways. Now, this was, this was the last run. We weren't coming back. There was no more money. That was it. It was retired. It was its last run ever. And so I don't know how your brain works during all that but it was like am i going to give up eight years worth of work throw everything away that we've done because this thing's sideways are you going to go for it well you know you're supposed to pull a parachute but i'm not very smart so yeah i legged it so that it went sideways this way locked to lock i saw the mountains over there 90 oh. degrees and it came back and then the third time as it's coming back it's coming back slower and i'm thinking how like i said i don't know how i don't know how all that works i'm not smart enough to know how that works but as it's coming back it's coming back slower and i and i'm saying to myself i can save this thing and i as it was coming back i picked the throttle back up and that baby picked up up and left and went through the light at 459.
at the time, we were the fastest piston car ever, ever, okay. for a year and a half before George beat us again. But we still hold the record because George Poteet is in the blown class and we're an unblown. <laughs> so, so we had the record. We were the baddest man at Bonneville for a year and a half. So. Dude, that's so, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. So anyway, was, I mean, that, that was the goal. And like I said, it was the last run. And we're lucky because when I got home and and we're taking it apart and not that it needed to take apart because it was done running, but I wanted to get all the oil out of the rear ends and stuff uh, so it didn't leak on the floor and all that stuff. And so I'm pulling the, pull the plug out of the front rear end and it was like no oil. So I go and get my, my sheet, right? And I'm going oil in the rear end, check. I'm going, hmm. I'm going, there's no oil in this thing. How did it even live? So I get in there with a piece of safety wire and I start, you know, jamming it around and all the bearings and stuff start falling out and then the oil comes was, behind it. it. It ate the bearings in the last run. So itself. it wasn't, it wow. wasn't gonna make another run. It was your time to, it, to it work. It was our time, you know, so, so it was, uh, you know, then we took, my wife and I took the car home and um, we're still smiling. We had to sell it. Unfortunately, we took it to Meekum and sold it at Meekum, but we had enough bills because once again, I'm such a good and astute businessman that I borrowed money to go racing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but we sold it, paid everybody back, you know, and um, we owe, we don't owe anybody any money and we still have the record. So I just want to go do it again. You know, I want to do it. I want to do it tomorrow morning. And then I want to make a return run tomorrow afternoon. Right. And then I would just want to go do it again the next day. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I'm only 74. I got some laps left, you know. Uh, Danny, thank you very much, oh, sir. You're welcome. You're thank welcome. you very much. Yeah.